Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of IBD Heal, a podcast brought to you by High Carb Health. I'm your host, Shakul, and today I am joined by Dr. Peter Johnson. Welcome to the show. Hi, Shakul. Um, Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here and um, hopefully of use to your audience. Absolutely. I'm I'm always can guarantee that it will be. So Dr. Peter Johnson is an accredited practicing dietitian, lifestyle medicine practitioner and wellness coach with a master's in nutrition and dietetics and a PhD in human genetics. Peter is also a fellow of the Australian Society of Lifestyle Medicine and has completed health coaching training with Wellstart Health. Peter runs a private practice, Perfect Human Food Consulting, offering individual consultations, public speaking, webinars, workplace health programs, and residential reboot programs. So very, very well credentialed, Dr. Peter Johnson, and we're going to be talking about a few interesting topics here today. But to start off with, we want to hear a little bit about your journey as to why you decided to uh, go and move to a plant-based diet. Uh, I grew up in New Zealand, so and I know you and Shamiz uh, spent Just time like us. there. So I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm from the south of New Zealand, and I had a pretty standard Western diet, although back then when I was a kid, because I'm getting on a bit, um, a bit long in the tooth, but we didn't have restaurant cafe food much when I was a kid. That was a, tr- a rare treat, and, and people didn't take adults to restaurants. Kids, people didn't take their kids to restaurants anyway back then in the 60s and 70s. So, and we had a big garden. My dad grew a lot of fruit and vegetables. We we didn't have much processed food. It was before supermarkets were in in Dunedin and before McDonald's or Kentucky Fried or any of those. So the worst you could do was a fish and chip shop, which is pretty bad. (laughs) That's pretty bad. (laughs) Uh, And yeah, so I ate lots of fruit and vegetables. And in fact, fruit was a bit of a treat at times. Dad would come home from the markets with a case of fruit sometimes, and we'd be so excited. Because mm. like most people then, we didn't have a lot of spare money. Um, but there was meat on the table at least once a day, dairy products, prevalent eggs. And when I was a young lad, I got a job in shearing gangs. I was 16, 17, 18. I did three summers. And we would eat a sheep a day seven of us a traveling gang so we had a cook who cooked all our food and a presser which was me three rousies three sharers we had three cooked meals a day because we were working from 5 a.m to 5 p.m and i my job was to hack up the sheep that the farmer had left hanging in the shed and cut off the grizzly bits the flies had got to and bring it up to the chef look or not chef that's a bit strong she was a cook (laughs) <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so things have changed a lot. In fact, while I was at university in New Zealand, I spent two summers with a biotech company collecting fresh sheep's blood from the slaughterhouse outside Christchurch. So we would bring a trailer with 1800 litre barrels and fill them up with fresh sheep's blood. We were making a vaccine with them for sheep. That was an anti tetanus vaccine, but so that was right on the killing chain. So I was vegetarian then, but not vegan. Uh, and, and those memories are seared into my brain. It was mm. appalling, smelly, noisy, mm. violent, horrible, horrible sight, seeing mm. these animals being pulled apart, cut apart. Um, uh, so I became vegetarian at 23 through living with a girlfriend. And then a decade later, I read John Robbins' seminal work, Diet for New America, and became fully vegan. And I was living in Canada by then doing my postdoctoral research. And um, that book was amazing. It changed a lot of people around the world. It came out in 87, Mm -hmm. and I found it in 91. Someone in India recommended it to me when I was traveling there on the way to my job in Canada. and it, it documents the health reasons, the, the ethical reasons and the environmental reasons for going plant based. And he was a really early, early leader in this. So that book really changed my life, as did mm. the, the, the first girlfriend I lived with who was vegetarian. So I owe huge thanks to both of them because it was really one of the, you know, they were sliding doors moments where it changed the course of my life mm. measurably for the better. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and um, what have you noticed about your health as you've gone through the years? You know, um, especially compared to some of your peers who maybe you grew up with and didn't make those changes. Um, because I see that with my parents. Um, mm-hmm. You know, my parents are well into their sixties now, and they're the only two people in their whole peer group that don't take any medication. Mm-hmm. You know, and they've mm-hmm. got good health. They still cycle. They ride their bikes. You know, twenty kilometers. Mm-hmm. You know, a few times a week and things like that. So, um, how have you found that change has affected your well, life? Well, it's I'm very healthy now, which would, I'm sure is due to the way I've eaten and lived for so long. But I, I mm-hmm. luckily never got any of the chronic diseases or or never was overweight. So mm-hmm. I haven't had any amazing turnaround story, you know, losing 300 pounds yeah. or, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's fine. I'm, in terms of like what I was trying to ask you is that how have you noticed because your health you were being good health obviously changing your diet yeah. in earlier age yeah. and you know obviously that's prevented you from possibly picking up any of these chronic illnesses but i'm sure you've had peers who you've grown up with over the years and oh, yeah. you know the differences in their health compared to yours how do, how have you noticed that oh yeah well i'm i'm unusual being being a healthy weight and not having mm. medications or any chronic disease that's very rare for someone at 64, which I am. So mm. it's, it's, I'm very much an aberration like that. So my old friends from New Zealand days, mostly overweight, mostly on medications, mostly got aches and pains, which I don't have. Mm. So I still do yoga regularly. I compete in speed windsurfing. I cycle, you know, I ski when I can. Mm. So I don't have any health problems. So I hate to think, you know, in fact, I know what I would have been much more debilitated if I'd continued on the, the diet that I grew up on. Mm. So it's it makes a huge difference. I'm grateful for the good health I've got. I do wonder what I would have been like if I'd had been raised fully whole food plant based from birth. And that's mm. one regret. I wish I'd started it that early because um, I, I suspect I may not need reading glasses. And I may have, you know, five, ten percent better health and mm. be a bit less aged. Yeah, I guess we all we all wish we could have started. I mean, I'm jealous of my kids who do have that luxury of having started from a, from, yeah. from conception. But um, absolutely, I think any time for anyone who's watching this, though, any time you're going to start, it's going to make a difference to your life. You know, the earlier the better. Absolutely. absolutely and the human body is a self-healing organism so most of the damage does heal so it's never too late even if you're in your 70s or 80s Mm. it's still incredibly worth changing and optimizing your diet and lifestyle because like any cut or bruise or broken limb leave it alone and it will heal the trouble of the western world is we we injure ourselves breakfast time start to heal then we injure ourselves again at lunch start to heal and then we slam more injury down the throat at dinner time so we're really never getting ahead if we have a unhealthy diet meal after meal day after day Mm. and combine that with lack of exercise too much stress poor sleep substance use you know Mm. tobacco alcohol etc it doesn't end well no no it doesn't now as a practicing dietitian or trained in dietitian dietetics I'm always fascinated as to, from your perspective, how do you see a plant-based diet? What are the benefits of choosing a plant-based diet over the other options? You know, you've got the non-vegetarian, you've got the pescatarian options, you've got the lacto-ovos, you've got the vegetarian, and you've got the fully, you've got the vegan, and then you've got the whole food Mm plant-based, you know, the whole spectrum Mm -hmm. of different ways people eat in today's society. What do you find as the the major benefits of shifting to the whole food plant-based well, the health of the person who eats that way is, is an important benefit. There's masses and masses of research, large population studies, randomized controlled trials mm. that show a plant-based diet reduces your risk of all-cause mortality, of getting diseases, disability, of having much higher chance of living to a healthy long age and not mm. needing care, not leading, needing to be put into a nursing home those kind of things. So that's enormous. Life is, it flies by and it's a precious gift. Mm. It's priceless. And 
most people don't really value their health enough until they've lost it. Mm. And so the health benefits are enormous, but what's actually my biggest driver now and for quite some time is, is getting our planet out of crisis. So mm. eating plants instead of animals is enormously lightens our footprint on the planet. Mm. And I can talk about that a bit more later, yeah. but yeah. that's my biggest driver because I fear at this point that we as a species and we may not make it and we will, we're taking many other species with us. Mm. The rate of extinction is alarmingly high across all forms of life on the planet. And mm. we might, f we're leading to a, a full on ecological collapse. And the single biggest thing nearly everybody can do is to change how they eat and mm. minimize or avoid animal food. But there's Absolutely. the, I'm definitely also driven by the ethical side of it. I mean, not just the ethics of stealing our children's and grandchildren future, but the ethics of the sentient beings that we're slaughtering in the billions. Mm. It's about 80 billion land animals a year globally slaughtered for food. Mm. And most of them have utterly miserable lives. And a trillion and a half or so fish sea animals mm. that are pulled out of the ocean and suffocate to death. And that's not good either because they have pain receptors. They want to live their lives. Um, Definitely. I'm, I'm driven on many levels. The yeah, I'm, 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 I'm with you and in, in all those things, you know, because it's this way of living and eating is the only thing that for me, uh, is like a triple win you know you say there's a win-win situation this is like a win-win-win because you've got your health you've got the environment and you've got the the ethical side of things which is so important as well so from from the perspective obviously the the research and the science shows that there are huge huge benefits you know we know the benefits for cancer we know the benefits for diabetes for heart disease uh for gut health and the microbiome um, you know, Shamiz and I have been helping so many people with IBD and, and mm -hmm. helping them get over it and co coming off, you know, majority of the people get off their medications as well, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, if the research and, you know, obviously you've got a very strong background in research, if it's, if it's strong enough to convince you and, and, you know, obviously there's so much information there why is it not well as well known in in society as maybe we think it should be yeah that's a, a, a an important question and one that i think about a lot and it frustrates me a lot um because hmm. i've known about this for 31 years the need to avoid all animal food um yeah the benefit benefits of doing that um there's a lot of cognitive dissonance. The The mainstream media don't really want to trumpet this because they take advertising money from mm. mainstream industries, agriculture, animal agriculture, pharmaceutical industries. The, mm. Even large parts of the medical associations have a vested interest in, in a lot of people getting sick and mm. doing stents and bypass surgery, for example. Uh, and the Food and Grocery Council producing a lot of the processed foods that are making us sick. They have a powerful influence on governments and media. They're big advertisers. So, uh, you know, to have a lot of articles in the popular media saying that we should avoid animal foods and processed foods would upset a lot of very powerful industry groups. Mm. And they were screaming blue murder and withdrawing their advertising dollars and withdrawing their political funding. Mm. Um, but people, people also like what they've grown up with. Diets mm. are deeply emotional and cultural. And there's a lot of family pull and social pulls. You, you can be very, feel like you're really ostracized. It can, you can feel like a social pariah if you don't eat animal food and you, you want to eat super well and look after your health. People mm. kind of want want to drag you in and accompany them. Like drinkers always try to encourage everyone else to drink alcohol mm. and, you know, go on just one won't hurt you, that sort of thing. So it's the same kind of thing. People feel a lot of peer pressure from workplaces, from family, from friends. I hear this from patients all the time, mm. how hard they feel mm. it is. Whereas 
and it, it depends on your personality. Like I'm someone mm. who's spent my life as an agitator trying to change society and I enjoy rocking the boat, but many people don't like to stick their head above the parapet like that. And mm. so they find it very hard to go against the community norms. And also we just live in a very obesogenic environment. So everywhere we turn, everywhere, every time you fill up for petrol, every time you go to a cafe or a supermarket, it's full of rubbish food, which will make mm. you overweight and sick. Mm. And, and it's beautifully packaged. It's beautifully presented. It's very alluring. We know how rich it tastes and how it gives us a dopamine hit. So it's incredibly hard to walk away from this stuff and say, that's not my food and stick to safe home cooking. Uh, so there's, there's so many reasons and, and health practitioners are not taught this. I wasn't taught about plant-based nutrition when I did my master's in nutrition and dietetics. I mentor new graduates about half a dozen this year and hopefully more next year. And they're telling me they're not taught this yet. Medical students are not taught this. So it's not yet filtering through, but mm. I've through doctors for nutrition, who I do a lot of volunteering with, I've presented at multiple medical student conferences in the last year and a half mm -hmm. and we're pushing to get into all of them and gp conferences we dfn has tables there mm -hmm. i volunteered at, at, at those um so we're getting awareness into the new generation it's kind of harder to change practitioners when they're well down their career path because mm -hmm. they you know medical people kind of get put on a pedestal in society they're revered and for them to step down and say actually sorry i was wrong the last two decades mm, mm. it takes some some gumption and some honesty and courage definitely so it's it's coming like i mm. got a chance to present to some a graduating class of dietitians 40 of them recently at la trobe university i'm working to get opportunities to present at other Melbourne universities and high schools. So this is a project of Doctors for Nutrition plus plant-based experts around the world like Dr. Michael Clapper are leading this charge as well. So change is coming and it's kind of growing exponentially finally after it seems like a mm. long, slow climb, but mm. this stuff is all over social media it's there are documentaries on Netflix. People are tripping over this. Every family has a vegan now. Everyone knows what it is. Hmm. It is a much different world to 30 years ago. Hmm. So I sense we're getting close to a tipping point mm -hmm. where this will have to be taught. Hmm. But but really it's negligence on a pretty gross scale that this isn't taught to dietitians and doctors. That's what I was gonna ask you. Why do you think is it do you think it's those same financial interests that are affecting yeah. uh, you think that's because it shouldn't we shouldn't be having financial interests in, in you know educational facilities where we're actually meant to be getting the real information to people who really need it um but it's there is it i don't think it's financial so much although right. you, and you can opt out of these promotions from animal ag from from dietitians australia now which they didn't used to be able to do so right. previously you'd get glossy promos from the egg industry and the dairy board and mm. meat and livestock Australia constantly pumping you with information. Uh, doctors get that stuff too, I think. So the, it's not so much the money. I think it just needs a generational change. And right. the, the lecturers who are teaching at these institutions were not taught this. So mm. many of them are not aware of it. And so the status quo rolls yes. on it's it's certainly right for change it's way overdue mm. and i'm frustrated that it that it hasn't percolated through yet and people aren't being taught this and i've it's on my agenda for the coming year to start rocking the boat more with doctors for new, for for dietitians australia to actually put it up to them mm. um, and get other plant-based dietitians on board and 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 say, look, it's overdue. This stuff ought to be taught. It's yeah. irresponsible not to arm new practitioners with this information. 
And mm. really the patient has a right to be offered what is a known cure for their disease. The fact that they're not, that, that really amounts to malpractice. I agree. The practitioners should know this. It's reversing heart disease is, that was published in, in peer reviewed literature 32 years ago. Now there's no excuse that this is not being taught and practitioners are not letting patients know that there is a way to reverse their heart disease. And many, many other chronic diseases can be reversed or arrested at the very least with healthy living. So mm. to me, the public are being hugely shortchanged in that then they're not even being t offered this as, a, as an alternative. Mm. And it could I be agree. that nine out of 10 say, no way, I'm not going plant-based. Well, that's, that's their call, that's fine. but at least they've been offered. We've been, we've been saying that for such a long time, you know, especially with, yeah. with our clients, you hear so many stories of my doctor never told me this and I've been mm. suffering for 10 years, 15 mm. years, 20 years, some of them yeah. 30 years with Crohn's mm. disease, colitis, you know, mm. IBS, all of these things. And it, these are debilitating. Like you don't have any quality of life. Mm. Um, no. And, and the medications are not very effective. You know, the biological um, immunosuppressive mm. medications, they have mm. a, they have a success rate of 35% over a year. So you're not, wow. not many people are actually getting the, mm. the symptom relief that they want. Mm. Um, and yeah, I completely I agree it, with you that, that it is, it is a real um, disappointment that they're not actually given the option. You know, they don't, they don't want to take the option and they want to choose the medical approach and they want the symptom relief, all power to them, but at least give mm. them the choice. Mm. Yeah. I think at some point there'll be um, litigation. Some you think so? grieved family who've lost their dad to a heart disease, who wasn't offered this will say, okay, I'm, now I'm suing. We should have been told this, you know, we needn't have lost our father and our husband. You know, mm. I think that point will come. Um, and hope I feel sad for the doctors who are caught up in that, but, but really this, this should be taught and, and pro continuous professional development. People who mm. weren't taught it should be picking this up in their training and the peak bodies should be including this in the, in the CPD so that practitioners are caught up with the science. Mm. Absolutely. Now talking about different diseases, I, I know that you've been doing a little bit of research into dementia recently. Um, and uh, I know you wanted to have a quick chat about how uh, the plant-based diet has an impact on on dementia because again, another one of these diseases that once you've got it, it's it's tricky. And if you can prevent it, surely you want to, you know, I mean my my grandmother had dementia and I saw her progress um, to the point where she couldn't she didn't know anyone and mm. you know then her, then her speech was affected and she couldn't talk and she couldn't communicate then when she was in pain and it was just heartbreaking to see um someone go through that kind of 10 years of just you know mm. deterioration um so yeah let's talk about that a little bit it's close to my heart <laughs> obviously you know having a, a loved one go through it but um yeah what 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 is dementia and then what can we do about it well, a subtle point too. I'd say I've been I've been doing reading, not research, because I think there's an important difference. <laughs> Sorry to be pedantic, but that's okay. It was it was one of those things that came up during COVID. People, you know, I've done my research, whereas no, yeah, people, oh, yes, <laughs> yes, they've, they've looked at Facebook maybe, or they've gone down some rabbit hole on YouTube. But mm. to me, that as a former researcher, it's not research; it's reading, and and not probably reading very judiciously, or it's mm. not evidence based stuff. So. Yeah, it's, I've had to, well, I offered to present a talk on dementia and Alzheimer's for a colleague here in Melbourne, Pasundra, who runs a, a charity, Green Karma, and she has some funding from local government to do classes every month on plant-based nutrition for community, which is fabulous. That's She's amazing. She's a yeah. whole series of plant-based practitioners presenting. So it led me to a deep dive over a few months around dementia and Alzheimer's. So mm. um, it's, it's, it turns out that it's like the other chronic diseases that afflict us like diabetes, like heart disease, it's mm. accumulation of damage over time. It can take decades to build up. It's not a natural outcome of aging. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's basically 
something that happens to us because of damage we've done to us ourselves and it it needn't occur but it unfortunately the incidence is escalating fast all around the globe because of the same unhealthy lifestyles predominantly diet but lack of exercise makes a big difference poor mm -hmm. sleep stress mm -hmm. these things also make a difference toxic substances like alcohol and tobacco the brain is an incredibly complex and hungry organism i mean organ in the body it it uses um up to a quarter of all of our blood supply mm. it, it's only two percent of our body weight um and it uses 20 percent of the oxygen we breathe 20 percent of the energy we burn and it has 15 to 20 percent of the body's blood supply so 650 mm. kilometers of blood vessels so it's a really important and hungry organ and it gets banged around by the poor lifestyle that, that damages the, the other organs and systems in our body. So it's a disease symptom. It's, it's not a normal part of aging. Mm -hmm. um, most dementia is Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. 60 to 80 percent, by far the most common. But there are over 100 diseases that can cause dementia. But the, the ones that are genetic, genetic are a very, very small proportion. Um, even if you have the, um, the genes, the APOE4 genes that people know about, if you've got both of two, two alleles of that gene, it still doesn't guarantee that you'll develop Alzheimer's. So, and the presenilin one and presenilin two, that the, those mutations or variants could account for less than 1% of mm. Alzheimer's. So, mm. The Scherzai's, Dean and Aisha Scherzai, who are coming out to Australia next February to present at the wonderful Doctors for Nutrition conference, which I highly recommend, they're mm. world leading Alzheimer's researchers and they estimate that 90% of Alzheimer's is preventable wow. in dementia through lifestyle. So, mm. just when is that conference? Just people listening in Australia, um, since you mentioned yeah. it. We should let people know when it's when it is and and um yes. you know how they can get there so um it's since in, you've already associated with them it's in melbourne okay yep yeah, it's in melbourne and it's on starts friday 17th and goes through till sunday 19th oh february so, february sorry yeah yeah february yeah so it'll be it'll be wonderful We've got some big international speakers mm. and some local experts um and some some local others like me and um so <laughs> so it should be fantastic so yeah so just to just to recap that sorry uh, peter doctors for nutrition conference on the 17th of february 19th. 2023 17th to 19th of february 2023 if you're in australia even if you're not in australia and you come down to australia for uh, make an excuse for a holiday there's some wonderful people speaking Unfortunately, we can't attend this year, Peter, because um, we're going to be in oh. New Zealand and just traveling back around that time. So, um, oh, that's but um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but we'll be at the next one, I'm sure. Right. So, um, yeah, it'll be terrific. There, there is a virtual option, apparently. Okay. So you can do it online if you can't make it to Melbourne. Right. So, yeah, so with, there's lots of options this... for that. Yeah, yeah. Back to dementia a little bit. Back to dementia, yep. Yeah, so there are different types of risk factors for dementia. So there's non-modifiable and modifiable factors. So the non-modifiable ones include age. So we can't change our age and the risk goes up as we get older. But for most people, that's just because they've had more time of banging around their brain with the wrong diet, mm -hmm. the wrong lifestyle. There's genetics, as I mentioned, so, but that accounts for one to 2%. Um, there's a family history, but more what that means is families inherit the way they eat and the way mm. they move, or if they move, if they're sporty, if they're sedentary, the recipes, those sort of things are much more of a factor in your family history and why you're more likely to get it if your parents have it or your brother mm. or your grandparents. Um, and wives of of husbands who get dementia are 600 percent more likely to get it themselves most likely for the same reasons because they've they've for decades they've been eating and living the same way as the husband 
Mm. Um, and women do, gender makes a small impact. Women get it, dementia and Alzheimer's a bit more than men. So one in six women compared to one in 11 men. And those, those are risk factors you can't change. Mm -hmm. um, the modifiable factors are the ones you might expect, which are behind all of the modern chronic diseases. So diet, exercise, smoking, alcohol, excess weight, high mm -hmm. blood pressure, high cholesterol, high blood sugar, mm -hmm. and low levels of cognitive engagement. So people with less formal education have higher mm -hmm. risks. So it seems like having a lifetime of significant cognitive engagement is protective. Mm -hmm. Social isolation is extremely harmful. That mm -hmm. increases your risks enormously. Mm -hmm. And as does being the spouse of an Alzheimer's patient, that increases your risk 600%. So I don't suggest leaving your partner once they get the diagnosis, but change the way you eat and live. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the, um, the scary thing about dementia and Alzheimer's is that beyond a certain point that it doesn't appear to be reversible. Mm. It, it's done. Your know, damage is, is beyond repair. If it's early stage cognitive impairment, yes, you can get a turnaround. So this is something it's far better to prevent than to mm. let get out of hand. Um, there's no cure. There's the medications only treat some of the symptoms like antisocial behaviors and anxiety and so forth. They don't slow the rate of progress they, and they certainly don't reverse the disease. Mm. So if you don't change your lifestyle, this is a one way street. Mm. Uh, it's, it's very sad and very tragic. And this is affecting millions and millions of people around the world. So. Mm. So if you if you get early stages of cognitive impairment, go hard on healthy living and eating mm. and it can reverse. But mm. the damage accumulates over decades. So it's, it's there's invisible damage that will still potentially have subclinical impacts. I would rather treat this priceless organ really, really well throughout my life to ensure mm. really good cognitive function. Mm. Um, some of it you know, continues, some of this damage happens in people of middle and later age through micro strokes, you know, so right. you're building up vascular dementia <clears> when <throat> little, little clots are from the arteries break off and go into the mm. brain mm. and just block a small sector of the brain. So you, you might lose half a percent or 1% with a micro stroke. And that if that happens 20, 30, 40 times, then you suddenly you've got a significant percentage loss of cognitive performance. So, mm. yeah, but the Western, the Western medical system, as Dean Ornish has really said, is, is kind of like, you know, the, the cartoon with the, the sink overflowing and the doctors in front of the sink mopping the floor furiously and not stopping to turn off the tap. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really geared to treating symptoms with yeah. pills and procedures and mm. I'm trained in lifestyle medicine, as you mentioned at the beginning, and, and lifestyle medicine is all about looking for upstream causes and addressing those. So in that cartoon with the sink overflowing, it would be looking around and going, okay, here's the problem. We need to turn off the tap hmm. instead of, you know, mopping the floor while the, the sink's still overflowing. So, and lifestyle medicine looks at, at diet exercise, sleep, stress, substance abuse, and social connection. Those are the big mm. six. Mm. If you optimize all of those, then you've got much better odds of having a long, healthy pain and medication free life. But interestingly, if any one of those is impaired significantly, like even being really good on all five, except isolation, mm. you're super isolated mm -hmm. and lonely. That's as toxic as having McDonald's every day. Wow or being a smoker or, or eating meat every day. It's all of them are important. Same if mm. you do the other five well and don't sleep well. Mm. Having really poor sleep is really, really toxic. It is. Um, so if you line up all those six and do them as well as you can, which includes plant-based eating or 95% at least, but 
why take the risk on that 5%? Mm. It's bad for the animals. It's bad for the environment. I don't support it ethically. Mm. It's still, well, from what we know, will injure you. So I would rather not have any. And one of the studies I've mentioned in this presentation I gave was 3,000 people, who, those who ate meat, fish or poultry, had double the risk of developing dementia. So that's a really big jump in risk. Mm. Um, those that ate five or more portions of fruit and vegetables a day, this is another study, they halved their risk of cognitive impairment. Mm. Um, if you're obese in midlife, that increases your risk of dementia by 40%. Mm. If you've got high insulin levels, that can increase your risk of Alzheimer's the same, 39%. Mm. Um, high cholesterol in midlife gives you a 60% higher risk of Alzheimer's later. So these, these things are all interconnected, but food is really the big one. Um, and it, the, the diet that's high in animal foods, we know from like other big studies, it, it increases total mortality mm. massively. Um, this one study I'm looking at, it, it gave a 400% increase in cancer risk and a 500% increase in diabetes risk. So it's, it's the same things that damage us in terms of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, that they damage the brain as well, which is not surprising because mm. it's part of our body. Yeah, I think so, as we're finding out more and more, the, the root cause for many of these conditions is the same same thing and just kind of manifest in the body in different ways and um yeah we just have to get to that root cause and we've got to try and reach as many people as we can that that you know we need to do all those six things as you mentioned to have mm -hmm. good health and the more of those mm -hmm. six things you do the better health that you're going to have and mm -hmm. do it before something happens because by that time it can be too late for a lot of different things i mean a lot of things can be reversed but why do you want to take that chance you know exactly mm. and and sometimes you might get unlucky and be the person that has a heart attack in your 30s or 40s which i've seen and mm. with something like heart disease there's pretty good odds that your first symptom will be sudden death yes. almost half of all half. heart attacks yeah. yeah they don't yeah. live to tell the tale so th there's no warning other than the two minutes of crushing chest pain and then you're dead Wow. So I don't want to roll the dice that way. Mm -mm. You know, I don't want that risk. Um, mm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's worth investing in the, in your, in our health because it, it is the most priceless thing we have. Having Probably. a fancy mansion and sports cars in the garage and it's not worth anything. If you, if you've wrecked your health and you, yeah. you need someone to help you with toileting and cleaning and yourself and you know, that, life's too priceless mm. absolutely now we we get our cars serviced we clean them we take care to put the right fuel in and yet we're so blasé about how we treat ourselves and and a, a single yeah. human cell is vastly more sophisticated than any car you could ever buy or definitely. even a space shuttle definitely absolutely yeah very well said now to finish off the the interview i wanted to touch on your most you know the, the topic that you're most passionate about which is how food and and the environment interplay and so we've got some time for you to just talk to the audience about the importance of you know how we're gonna make sure that we keep this world in a in a reasonable mm. condition uh, yeah. moving forward yeah well I've got a talk I give on this and I'm giving it at the Doctors for Nutrition conference and I've presented it quite a few other places now, but mm. it's actually quite grim, but it is a powerful message that the less animal food we eat, the better for mm. the environment. And we have that power in our hands in, in every meal we sit down to, to make a, a significant positive difference. But the, the things I, I cover in the talk that our food choices impact upon so health we've spoken about, but mm. it affects global warming. It affects biodiversity loss, mm. water shortages. We're, we're running out of farming water around the globe, increasing the risk of zoonotic diseases. So these mm. are things like COVID, SARS, HIV, 
75 percent or so of our modern infectious diseases have jumped to us from animals because of our unnatural proximity to animals mm -hmm. over prolonged periods and it increases the risk of these animal diseases crossing over to humans mm -hmm. uh, we're we're running out of antibiotics because of administering about 80 percent of the world's antibiotics to livestock prophylactically and and to help them grow faster mm -hmm. We're depleting the world's topsoil at a fast rate. Mm. There's ethical issues, there's deforestation, there's the inefficiency and waste of animal farming, which I'll mention briefly. There's the inability to feed the world's population by 2050. We already have almost a billion humans hungry. Mm. And one of the first things we're going to see with the ecological crisis that we're approaching is more famine. We're already seeing difficulties with, you know, food bowls like the Ukraine not being able to export their wheat or grow it. But floods mm. are wiping out crops, droughts and heat waves are wiping out crops. Mm. So mm. hunger is a big one. There's also ocean dead zones and mm. from runoff from animal farms on the land mm. and fisheries collapse through overfishing. So it's, a, it's quite a list of calamities that are bearing mm. down upon us. But I think a, a good statistic to or some figures to illustrate the size of the problem in 2019 or it might have been 2018 some oxford university researchers poor and Nemesic, published a, a huge and vastly researched paper in the science journal mm. a, a prestigious peer-reviewed journal and they surveyed all of the world's food production pretty much 96 percent of the globe's Food production because this data is now available mm. and what they found was that animal agriculture takes up 83 percent of all the world's farmland and yet it produces only 18 one eight 18 percent of the calories mm. that's what i mean by inefficiency and and waste it's mm. incredibly mm. wasteful what they estimated as well was that if we stop producing all animal food so the whole world went vegan Mm -hmm. We could put 76% of the world's farmland back to wilderness. Now, that would just give the earth such a breather. Mm. It would draw mm -hmm. down so much CO2. It would allow biodiversity to flourish again. It would l lighten the load of fossil fuels, mm. pesticides, mm -hmm. fertilizers. Because animal food production is like a food factory in reverse. Mm. You know, you... you Many of the world's livestock are now grain fed mm -hmm. and generally you, you might fend, feed around 10 kilos of grain and get one kilo of beef back. Mm. This is this is really a medieval food production system that we don't need anymore. I mean, it's time we moved on to something mm. more modern and efficient. I, I read a stat um, a little while ago that said, you know, 100 years ago, the majority of the, the animals on the planet were wild. Whereas nowadays, the vast majority of the the animals on this planet are farmed, so the actual yes. the actual animals that exist in in the wilderness is I mean, it's something shocking, like less than five percent of the total animals. Yeah, am I correct in saying that? I think that's what I remember. Yeah, and you're like, I, I how can that even be? You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My talk leads off with the two pie charts showing that. So. 10,000 mm. years ago, at the dawn of agriculture, humans were 1% of the mammalian biomass on the globe, and wild mammals were the other 99%. The, those wild mammals are now down to 1.5% of mammalian biomass. Humans are 32%, but cattle and other livestock comprise 67% of all the mammals on the planet. And when you extend that out to vertebrates, so all animals with a spine on the land, so it's so non mammals, it's similar. Mm. It's very similar. Mm. About 1% of vertebrates left are, are wild. We, the cattle and the livestock, other livestock, take up the vast majority of the Earth's surface in terms of mm. animals. And it's the same with birds. 70% of all the birds on the planet now are poultry and animals we eat. Not you and I, but but our fellow humans. So it's yeah, it's devastating, and the the wild species are in collapse. Mm. So what little is left are facing 
really tough times. Like the the rate of extinction is going up enormously. Mm. The probably the most scary thing for me though is the collapse of insect populations. Mm-hmm. So you might be too young to remember, but thirty years ago in Australia, if you drove around, no, oh, I remember. <laughs> yeah, and in the dusk your car would get covered in bugs. You'd have to stop and clean the window. It mm-hmm. would, you might need a radiator cover to stop it blocking up. Mm. Your lights would get covered and there'd be huge moths and bugs everywhere. Nowadays, that doesn't happen. No. Like the, an example is the Australian bogong moths. They've had a 99% decline. Mm. Now, this is not just bad for the bogongs. Those are food for a lot of other critters. Birds, lizards, mm. other reptiles. Mm. Mm. Eat these eat these insects, and when the insects go, we go. And and the rate of insect population decline is two and a half percent per year. So that might sound quite small, but in a decade, that's a quarter. Mm. So we think it's thought that we've already lost about seventy percent of the mass of insects. You know, and worse than some like bogong moths. So this is mm. depends on the animal. You know, there always seem to be blowflies every summer but, and mosquitoes. I never get sick of those. <laughs> I, won't, I won't miss them, but they do have an important ecological niche. Absolutely, you know, we need yeah. them, Absolutely. They're not my friends, but anyway, I'll let them be. And <laughs> I catch a blowfly inside with a piece of tissue. I'll take it out and let it fly away. But, um, but this, is, uh, this really alarms me, you know, mm. and it, the loss of insects is driven primarily by land clearing, lots of... Mm plants they can live in and pesticides yes and this is also taking out our pollinators yes so that's 75 a huge percent thing. of the yeah 75 percent of the world's food crops need pollinators hmm. so another reason we, we will face famine if we don't turn things around hmm. uh, so it's it's quite grim Yeah, but I mean, if we don't get the information out, then people won't change. So we need people to know about it. So thankful for you uh, sharing it and being so passionate about, you know, teaching people about, I mean, uh, it's it's unreal, the amount of species. And to think about the fact that the natural world is in perfect symbiosis, you know? Yeah. It's the human mm-hmm. that is out, outside, of, outside of that step, mm-hmm. you know, where... Mm-hmm. where We've moved yeah. in a different direction to to being in symbiosis with the world, and and that's what's causing yeah. all these issues. It's um, yeah, yeah, it's alarming. It's it's eye opening, and we need to move back towards more of a natural environment. You know, like and yeah. and and one of the steps to do that is to eat a natural diet, mm. plant based diet. Yeah, it's a huge step. Mm. Um, we we need to reduce our consumption on every level, though. Um, not not food, but we need to shift what we eat. But we need to use less energy. Mm. You know, we're, we're, our ecological footprint is 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 that of one point seven Earths, and we don't yeah. have one point seven Earths, yeah. and that's increasing as people get more wealthy around the world. Mm. So definitely, definitely, will. yeah, yeah. It's I think I still think the first thing you know you're going to find it hard for part of people to go up there some of the amenities and their cars and things, but you can you can change what you eat. Mm overnight Easily. you know that, that's something yeah. you can do straight away well the other thing that's it's a bit more subtle but i find it changes people's consciousness i find it it makes people more empathic mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. i think we'd be less likely to have wars if people were all plant-based mm-hmm. i think we're more likely mm-hmm. to listen to each other and more likely to collaborate mm-hmm. um i just i don't want to sound uh, like high and mighty, but I, I think it does create that what I've what um, Jeremy Rifkin, a, an interesting thinker, has called biosphere consciousness. You become more concerned with other beings mm. and plants and living living things on the planet, and and more empathic, which is critical. We need a lot more of that in the world if we're going to survive, because. We've got to do a lot of dramatic changes in how we live as a species if this earth and our and our species is to survive. And that's going to need some collaboration and mm-hmm. generosity mm-hmm. of spirit and compassion for others. Um, 
And I think that a, the, the, it's not to say that people eating an omnivore diet aren't compassionate, but it, it changes it somewhat when you're, when you're plant-based. Yeah. I've noticed the difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's a gentleness. Okay. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a concern for others. Cause you're not eating, you're not, you're not eating the fear and the, you know, the anger and all of those things that are associated with when you eat that animal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the violence of a, mm. of a sentient being that's had its life taken against its will. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's a shift in thinking that, that I think is important and will help us get through this if we are going to get through the next few decades. Definitely. Well, you know, I think that's, you know, obviously a somber message, but an important one to end, end the interview, Peter. Um, you know, very thankful for you taking the time to to share your knowledge with us um you know peter has been in this field for a long time he's been on a plant-based diet for a very long time and you know i think it's very important to listen to people who have walked the walk for such a you know decades and uh so again as i said thank you peter for sharing uh and the information that he shared with with you guys is valuable stuff you know some of the things that he shared with us around how to prevent disease how why we need to shift to a plant-based diet not only for our health but for the environment and for for other ethical and moral reasons you know if we if we open our hearts and we if we think about that it's more than just our taste buds that are at stake here um you know we can make big shifts and make huge changes and you, you don't have to do it for anything else just do it for yourself <laughs> right if you if you if you only want to do it for your health then yes but it's going to impact other things as well so um and what i found peter was that when i did shift for my health it, as you said it opened up my consciousness to other factors you know towards the animals towards the environment so kind of like opens your awareness to different different things now for everyone who's watching this thank you for joining us and i hope you found the uh information that peter shared with us useful i'm sure you have if you have uh if you're listening to this on the podcast please share this uh, with as many people as you can if you're watching this on youtube do the same and if you haven't subscribed to our channel hit the subscribe button and click on that little bell notification icon to get notified of all our recent uploads, including more incredible interviews just like this one. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. It helps us reach more people. And if you have any questions, please list them down below and we'll try and answer them the best as we can. Apart from that, thank you all once again. Don't forget, eat plants and lots of them. Take care. Thank you, Peter. Pleasure. Thank you for having me.